Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be with you on this Tuesday for another episode of the podcast. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. Mine was busy and um, I got a lot of stuff done. Got some reading done, which is always good, and got some housework done, which is always good, but not as fun. I'd rather read, but hey, I did a lot of laundry, which... It needs to be done, uh, or the family is naked, um, or just wearing dirty clothes. I guess I don't have to go the total extreme, do I? Enough of that. Yeah, I am very happy to be with you again for another episode and another interview episode. Today, I am speaking with mystery author Roger Johns about the second book in his Wallace Hartman mystery series. It is called River of Secrets, and let me go ahead and give you the description of this book. Herbert Mariano, a Louisiana pol politician infamous for changing his mind on hot-button issues, has been murdered and his body posed to send a message. Baton Rouge homicide detective Wallace Hartman has to figure out who's sending the message. DNA points to Eddie Pitkin, a social justice activist who also happens to be the half-brother of Wallace's childhood best friend. But even with the combative history between Pitkin and Mariano, murder seems out of character for Pitkin, whose usual M.O. is to confront the wealthy and powerful with their inconvenient past. As Wallace digs deeper, she unearths a possible alibi witness, along with evidence of a deeply troubled relationship that points the finger of suspicion at Mariano's son. While Eddie's supporters are convinced of his innocence, his enemies are equally certain of his guilt. Under pressure from all directions, Wallace pursues her investigation into the dark heart of the political establishment as Baton Rouge falls under the shadow of escalating violence. When it appears a police department insider may be sabotaging her efforts by leaking information about the case, and after menacing messages are left for her and her loved ones, Wallace is forced to untangle a trail of old and disturbing secrets, unaided by those she most needs to trust. So that is the description of River of Secrets. It is the second in the Wallace Hartman mystery series. And as you can tell, this is n this is a complicated case. One thing that I often think when I read mysteries is, mm -hmm, yeah, I um I do not have the I, I do not have the skill set to be an investigator of any kind. I do not have the skill set to be a police detective, one who untangles mysteries and follows the clues because this book takes so many twists and turns and there's so many there's there's so much that points in one direction but there's just an, another amount of evidence and clues the point in another direction and Wallace thank goodness is the main character not me because she is able to sort through it and figure out what is going on I mean it takes you know it takes a while and it takes a lot of digging and it takes there there's some danger involved uh it's not it's it's suspenseful it has a lot of twists and turns and but it's not it's not like thriller suspense scary necessarily, which I always appreciate because I'm kind of, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of like jump scares and movies and those types of things. It is scary in one way, not like eek scary, you know, like things that go bump in the night or things that jump out at you, whatever. It's, it's scary in the sense that it is so accurate in its depiction of a lot of the things that are going on in society today. In, as you know, society is very polarized right now. There's a lot of hot button issues that are happening. The, the country is divided in ways that are unfortunate. And um, this book addresses a lot of those issues. Uh, 
because Baton Rouge is a place that witnesses a lot of those issues. It's kind of a microcosm of what the rest of the country is seeing more and more of as well. And so it's it's scary only in that it portrays it so well and it's so hard to read and see all of this that's going on and to know that it's not just fiction. So I think that Roger did a really great job of bringing that to the book, of exploring those issues, of trying to portray everything that's going on and the tension involved around them. Wallace as a character also is, is great at navigating those and trying to figure out how, how to navigate, how to do her job, how to protect her family, etc. It's very well written and I really enjoyed the book. So, uh, looking forward to more Wallace Hartman mysteries. Um, I, I love the fact that her first name is Wallace. I don't know any women whose name is Wallace, but they're, I'm sure they're out there. Um, do you know any women whose name, first name is Wallace? I would love to hear about that. I have a fascination with names. What can I say? At any rate, let me move on. I do have copies of this book for a giveaway, so stay tuned to the end of the episode to find out how you can enter the giveaway to win a copy of River of Secrets. It is a Wallace Hartman mystery. The author is Roger Johns, and he stopped by the podcast to talk about this book and this series, and I would like for him to do the talking now rather than me. So without further ado, let's turn to that interview with Roger Johns. Hi, Roger. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sarah. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. I'm happy to have you here as well. And we are here to talk about your newest book, River of Secrets. Before we do that, though, I would love for my listeners to get to know you a little bit. So can you tell us a little about yourself? Sure. I live in Georgia now. My wife and I have lived here for about 13 years. Uh, I grew up in central Louisiana, a little town called Alexandria, and lived the first half of my life in Louisiana. I moved around the country uh, from east coast to west coast, uh, through the south and the southwest, uh, with a college teaching career. And when I decided to retire, our home was here, so uh, we had stayed. All right. Thank you for that. So tell us a little bit about River of Secrets. River of Secrets is the second mystery in the Wallace Hartman Mysteries. These are set in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Wallace Hartman is the main character. She's a homicide detective uh, on the Baton Rouge Police Force. And in River of Secrets, she is investigating the murder of a white Louisiana legislator, And the man accused of the crime is a black social justice activist who happens to be the brother of Wallace's longtime since childhood friend. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of complications in this story. (laughs) Um, What was your inspiration for the story? My stories, well, both of my books, this one and the previous book, Dark River Rising, are both set in Baton Rouge. And this aspect of the town and the state and the times are something that I didn't feel like I could continue to write books set in this part of Louisiana and set in this part of the country without eventually dealing with this issue of race relations, uh, specifically race relations in Baton Rouge. And there were other elements of uh, a story, the ideas of betrayal, the ideas of uh, change and the chaos that comes in the wake of change, social change, technological change, that I felt worked really well together to, to make a strong story. So um, I just went for it uh, with book two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's a very timely book, unfortunately, um, but you really address a lot of the things that we're seeing all the time in the news and um, just in general that's going on that, that seems like things feel very polarized, to say the least. So, um, yeah, you definitely, you definitely hit that. Thank you. I tried to do it with a lot of heart uh, and a lot of understanding. Uh, I love Baton Rouge. I love all the places I've been. But every place has secrets. Every place has troubles. And uh, I wanted to show both both sides of the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So then talk about the main character, Wallace. Um, what about her do you think will resonate with readers? I hope the fact that she is a fully-fledged character. Uh, the book started uh, with a man as the main character, a man who has become a major secondary character, but he turned out not to be the right character to carry these stories forward. I write mysteries, and my books are the happy, uh, plot-driven. But for me, this is more a story about a woman who happens to be a detective instead of a detective who just happens to be this woman named Wallace Hartman. So the stories center heavily on her. She's in on the cusp of middle age. She's begun to question some of her choices in life, but she's also begun to deal with some of the things that have happened or things that she's caused to happen in her life that didn't turn out so well. So she's perched on a lot of things that may challenge her in the future, but a lot of things that uh, bring hope uh, to her in the near term. Uh, she is, uh, I think, complicated and real and uh, fearless. And if I wanted the readers to come away with uh, any basic impression before they ever picked up a book, uh, it's fearless and sticks to our principles is the main thing I would like people to know about it. Yeah, absolutely. Even when it's hard to do. Yeah. And I actually, I really like Wallace as a character. And I like the fact that she is, as you say, on the cusp of middle age, because we don't often get that age group for female protagonists. So it's nice to, it's just nice to have that represented. Thank you. So I'm going to do my usual interrupting bit here so we can take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about autobiographical elements in the book, why the book is set in Baton Rouge, uh, and a lot more. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and we'll be right back. The average sedan is built with a steel frame and equipped with six airbags. Remember this the next time you see someone walking. Drivers, be aware. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. The average SUV has two blind spots, weighs between four and 6,000 pounds, and takes about six seconds to stop. Remember this the next time you're on foot. Pay attention, people. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Roger Johns, author of the Wallace Hartman Mystery Series. We are speaking about his second book, River of Secrets. So let's go ahead and get back to that interview. Yeah. Um, are there autobiogra uh, excuse me, autobiographical elements in the story or the characters? Uh, in a very specific way, there's only one thing. In a very general way, I'm mining the nooks and crannies of my experiences in Baton Rouge. Uh, the the only real specific autobiography detail uh, is, uh, shows up in this book and in the previous book. Uh, when I was a little boy, my dad had a store, and the alleyway behind the store was the dividing line between the white section of town and the black section of town. And beyond the alley, there was a, a home where a black family lived and they had two kids. And those were the children I played with in the afternoons after school. And I would, you know, it was a, a small store. My, both of my parents worked there. So that's where I ended up every day after school. And I would end up in the backyard of the house behind the store playing with the kids. And it was a little boy and a little girl. The little girl called me Roger, and uh, her brother, who was my age, uh, called me Little White Boy. And that's all he would ever call me. Uh, so in the beginning of this story, when we, uh, a River of Secrets and a Dark River Rise the Boat, we see that Wallace has maintained a friendship with uh, someone that she has known since childhood, and it's the same thing. Uh, a little boy that she grew up playing with, uh, who was African American and who called her little white boy and, and wouldn't, or little white girl and wouldn't call her anything else. For some reason, that stuck with me through the many decades since my childhood, and it seemed like a good way to 
make a bridge between parts of the community that Wallace would be working. And mm -hmm. so far, it's worked out fairly well for me. Yeah. Uh, are you still in touch with that family at all? I am not and have not been since I was a little boy. My dad moved his store when I was four years old. Oh, my. And uh, the, the house is no longer even there. And I know that only because I've recently looked uh, on Google Street Maps and uh, very little of uh, that part of town is the way that it was when I was a little boy. Uh, had I not known exactly where to look, I probably uh, wouldn't have known that the house was there or not. Uh, but, but no, I haven't kept in touch with them. I just, they were kids I played with because I lived in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. okay. my, my family's business was in the neighborhood. Right. Just curious. Um, what kind of research did you do for this particular book? Well, um, I did a little bit of research just in terms of the town itself. I lived in Baton Rouge for 10 years, and I know it very well, but uh, things change. So I looked very carefully at uh, the layout of some parts of, of Baton Rouge, and I looked into some of the, because racism and race relations are an important part of the story, I looked into some of the dark corners uh, of areas on the internet to find things that I needed to make this story look and read well. Um, things that, I, some of the things I found frightened me to the point where I, I couldn't put them in the book. I didn't even want to read them anymore. But other things, small details, I thought would make this look real enough. Uh, so I was able to use those. Uh, with respect to Wallace, uh, I didn't do research so much as I took lessons on how to write a female character. Mm -hmm. okay. I spent a year with a women's writing group when I first started writing this character, uh, and they taught me how to do that because I, I couldn't do it on my own. I, it, it was uh, uh, the character just didn't really work and didn't work as a woman. It worked as a guy with feminine pronouns, and uh, this group of women writers uh, showed me how to do this. So that, to the extent I got it right, it's all there. They get the credit. That's awesome. Yeah, because uh, sometimes when you, in fact, it's it's a theme on some of my social media, as I, media pages I see when um, you have men writing female protagonists, you get some really interesting um, sentences sometimes. And so people will post those sentences for how they've described the women. And I didn't get any of that in this book. So good job you and good job you're with to the women's writing group. Yes, yeah, all praise to them. Uh, I'm, I'm just so grateful and thankful, A, that they took me in, and B, that they were such patient uh, tutors because uh, it, it couldn't have been easy for them. <laughs> so as we've mentioned, this is the second Wallace Hartman mystery. The first one is called Dark River Rising. Can you talk a little bit about that book? Sure. Dark River Rising came out of a question that popped into my head for no reason I can think of other than it just popped into my head. I was a college professor at the time. I was teaching a class on international business transactions. And one day on the way to class, I just wondered why is it that the uh, South American cocaine cartels do a certain part of their business the way they do? I could think of a much easier, faster, safer uh, way for them to, to carry out part of their business. I did a little research and found out that it can't be done the way that I was thinking of, but I thought, well, what if someone figured out a way to do that? And how would that disrupt the cocaine trafficking part of our world? And what would that look like on the street every day to a police officer who was dealing with the chaos that came in the wake of this sort of a change? The story just nattered away at me for years and years until finally I got serious uh, and, and sat down and, and wrote the book. Um, and as I envisioned the book, it was uh, these rivers of, of illegal drugs, uh, rivers of data that law enforcement uses to ferret out the bad and the bad things. 
and of course this ever-present river that runs right alongside that Bruce, uh, the mighty Mississippi, uh, which is never far from anyone's mind. So all three rivers sort of coalesced around uh, the book. The title was something that the editor at St. Martin's came up with. Uh, thank goodness, I think she did a really good job. I would never have thought to, to couch it in those terms. Mm -hmm. And so it's Dark River Rising and then River of Secrets. Will you incorporate River? In if it, it, First, will this be a series, and will the titles incorporate the word River? Well, uh, I hope it's a series. Uh, on the cover, my publisher has put uh, Wallace Hartman Mystery, so I'm hoping this thing will go on for quite a while. I'm enjoying writing the character, and I'm enjoying uh, revisiting uh, the city of Baton Rouge for a number of reasons. Some of them are personal, and I'm happy to talk about that, uh, and some of them are purely professional. Um, so, yes, let's... Uh, let's Unfortunately, we had a little bit of technical difficulties there with the phone line cutting out. Um, basically, he just said we're keeping our fingers crossed that it will be a series, and hopefully they'll all have River in the title. So um, apologies for the technical difficulties, but then we got things sorted out. So how has Wallace evolved or maybe not evolved as a character through from the first to the second book? That's a, a really touchy question, I think, for series fiction writers, because if a character doesn't change, readers will quickly lose interest. But if a character goes through too much development, well, no one's going to believe that they've got yet further things uh, on the horizon for them. So you have to go at it sort of on an inch-by-inch -inch basis. Uh, the way I've decided to deal with it is uh, to have her inner self evolve rather slowly, but for her to make decisions and encounter situations in one book uh, that she has to deal with in the next book. Um, so it gives the appearance that uh, there's a lot going on with the character without her having to go through an entire lifetime of evolution uh, within the space of a single book. And, of course, I didn't invent this technique. Um, it's something that I learned from reading other very successful um, series writers. So Wallace is dealing with things that she embarked upon in the first book, which was to come in out of the cold, so to speak. She's no longer in this self-opposed uh, emotional exile that she had been in for a few years, and now she's dealing with the effects of having made that decision in book two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Quick interruption here so we can take our second break of the podcast. When we come back, we will have the conclusion to this interview and we'll be talking about books, obviously, but the writing process and advice for aspiring authors. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and I will be right back. The average sedan is built with a steel frame and equipped with six airbags. Remember this the next time you see someone walking. Drivers, be aware. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. The average SUV has two blind spots, weighs between four and 6,000 pounds, and takes about six seconds to stop. Remember this the next time you're on foot. Pay attention, people. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion to my interview with author Roger Johns. So you've mentioned Baton Rouge several times. It is the location of the book. And so talk about your decision to set the series in Baton Rouge. It's really the only thing that I never dithered about during the entire process. The character, the main character in, in uh, the first book changed. Uh, whole storylines came and went. Uh, characters that had been dead uh, came back to life, uh, and vice versa. Uh, and a lot of the science that was in the first book completely went away uh, and was reduced to a bare minimum because I didn't want to. I didn't want to bore my readers with things that I found interesting, but I didn't think the general mystery reader would find all that interesting. 
The only thing that never changed was the city, was Baton Rouge. The 10 years that I lived there were the 10 most interesting years of my life. Uh, I had moved to Baton Rouge from that little town in central Louisiana where I had lived a uh, rather sheltered suburban life to a town that had a major university. It was the capital of the state, and it was divided into a very peaceful, prosperous southern half and a very chaotic, dangerous northern industrial half. And for a few years when I lived in Baton Rouge, I, lo I lived in the southern part and worked in the northern part. And that difference between the chaos and the violence that I witnessed almost on a daily basis in my work life and the calm and peacefulness uh, that I experienced during my personal life at home left a very strange set of marks on me. And I've never fully understood uh, that experience. And as I write these books, I spend a lot of time paging back through those days. The, the memories are very vivid, and they set the tone for these books. And I think that writing these books is giving me a way to uh, come to terms with what I saw and what I found, the things that made me feel good and the things that disturbed me terribly uh, about Baton Rouge. So I'm grateful for the chance to write these books. I'm grateful for the chance to explore all these things, and I'm grateful for the chance uh, to have this character, Wallace Hartman, be the one who carries these stories so that it's not just an autobiography. It's, uh, it's someone digging into things beyond what they saw uh, in real life and to come up with explanations uh, for what it was that made things the way they were. So very, very strange, and so, but, but so hopeful as well. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, Baton Rouge is almost another character in the story. Did you do that intentionally, or did that just kind of come out of the writing process? I think it was probably a bit of both. It's just impossible uh, for me to write these books and set them someplace else, just as it would be uh, impossible for me to have written the second book uh, without Wallace as the main axis around which the book uh, revolves. It is such an interesting and unique place. I just can't imagine uh, having these stories set anywhere else. They're, they're dangerous stories. And they're, they're set in the dangerous parts of Baton Rouge, or at least some parts of the story are. So it seems perfectly suited as a place to, to, to write the stories that Wallace undergoes or goes through, lives through. Mm -hmm. And what's next? Are you working on another book, another book in the series, another book in general? I'm working on two more books, a, a third book in the Wallace Hartman series, and this one deals with... Uh, trafficking, uh, human trafficking. And the other book is a standalone about a uh, dirty cop. I don't know exactly where it's set yet. It could be somewhere in Louisiana. I'd, I'd like to move it out of Baton Rouge, although it may end up there. Um, but it's about a dirty cop who preys on other criminals. Uh, there was a, a guy, a bank robber back in the 50s, I think. Someone said, so why do you rob banks? Well, that's where the money is. Uh, was his answer, and so this dirty cop, uh, she preys on other criminals because that's where the money is. Whenever they have ill-gotten gains, that's what she goes after. Hmm. Uh, and who are they going to tell, right? Interesting. Okay, thank you for that. And then um, when did you start writing? I know you were a, a professor, so obviously you wrote throughout your career, I'm sure. Um, when did you decide to start writing fiction? It was about 10 years ago that I started thinking that I was going to write these novels. I had tried to write things. I tried to write science fiction short stories uh, back in the 80s, um, and for some reason I could just I, I could never make that work out. Um, in the early 90s, I even tried writing comedy or television. I moved out to L.A., you know, got sort of connected out there, and... Uh, that didn't happen, so I put it aside for a while, and then when this idea for this book came up, um, I tried to ignore it, uh, but it wouldn't go away. So I would say that the serious part of it started about 10 years ago, and the really, really serious part started about uh, four or five years ago. Okay. And do you, do, do you write full-time, or are you still working uh, in another area? I, uh, I tried to retire a few weeks before I got completely bored, uh, so I 
decided to resurrect this idea that I had dithered around with uh, in the final years of my teaching career. And this is now all I do. I'm either writing a book, promoting a book, or editing a book. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yes. This is something I can go on about probably for days, so please stop me when, <laughs> whenever you're done listening. Um, the first thing, of course, is, is uh, never lose heart, never stop. It, you have to write a good book, and you have to be lucky. Both things have to happen. Uh, but there's a way you can improve the odds on both scores. Uh, get out of your house and join the local writing community. Go to writers' conferences. Learn from other writers. Join critique groups. And when you get too friendly with the members of that group, quit and join another one because the last thing you want is to be going to a weekly or a monthly club where everyone's patting you on the head and you're no longer learning anything. Um, and then go to conferences where authors and agents are out shopping for new authors. Uh, the Atlanta Writers Conference is one, but there are conferences like this all over the country. You, you have to get lucky, and it's not likely that it's going to be in your office or at your house. It's going to be someplace where people are looking for new writers to add to their portfolio, and writers' conferences are the, the best place you can go as a writer. Uh, to get a target-rich environment because you can connect with several uh, agents and several editors uh, within the space of a day or two. Uh, and, and never, never, never neglect your craft. It's always something you will be learning uh, no matter how long you do it. Uh, there's always something new to learn. See, that wasn't, that wasn't long-winded at all. Well, I tried to self-censor myself <laughs> from the beginning because I... I I had other things I could have said, but that's the basics of it. So. Yes, that, w that was very concise. I, I applaud you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, I know you have a, a website. Can you, so tell people the, the website address and where they can find you on social media. Uh, they can find me. Uh, my website is www.rogerjohnsbooks.com, and they can find me at rogerjohns10 on Twitter, and they can find me at Roger John's Books on uh, Facebook. Okay. Thank you so much. Is there anything that we have not covered that you would like to talk about in terms of writing or your book specifically or anything that we haven't touched on? Well, I might, I might add this uh, to go back to a question you had a minute ago about um, <clears throat> advice for other authors. I, I know I tried to stop myself, but uh, I'm weak and I'm going to give in and, <laughs> and, and ask one more thing. If there's a type of book that you like to write, read others who are writing that. Read others who are getting the big reviews and whose books are heavy in the media, generating a lot of buzz. Uh, writers whose books seem to stay in print forever. Uh, the best advice I think I can give is if you ever want to find out how to do something you don't already know how to do, uh, look for someone who's doing it and doing it well and just follow them around. And as a, an aspiring author, that's easy to do. All you have to do is, is buy their books or go to your library and get their books and read them. But don't just read them for entertainment. Study them. Uh, study how they achieve the effect that they achieve. If you're hooked within the first two pages, well, there's something on that page that did it for you. Go back and read it and read it and read it until you figure out how they did that little bit of magic. Um, I'm constantly reading new authors, those who are uh, earlier in their career and those who are much later in their career. Um, there's always somebody doing something new and interesting that you can learn from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I also want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your weekend to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Uh, the new book is River of Secrets. The first book is Dark River Rising. And so, Roger, thank you so much. Sarah, thanks for having me. I, it was just an absolute pleasure to be on the, the show with you today. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. You too.
Once again, a huge thank you to Roger Johns for appearing on the podcast to talk about not only River of Secrets, but uh, the Wallace Hartman mystery series about writing, etc. It was a pleasure to speak with him, have a conversation with him. The book is a mystery. It is very full of twists and turns, and uh, I think Wallace is a wonderful main character. And I think that you should enter a giveaway and win a copy of this fabulous book. It's easy to do that. All you have to do is go to one of our social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Those links are in the show notes. And just comment on the episode, episode 111 interview with Roger Johns. That's it. It couldn't be easier. Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram comment on episode 111 interview with Roger Johns, and you will be automatically entered to win a copy of River of Secrets. So if you're looking for a good mystery, now's your chance. Jump jump on this chance to, to enter the giveaway. I, again, want to thank Roger for joining me. I want to thank you for always joining me and listening to the Book Review Podcast. I hope you will join me again on Thursday. Did you know that it's Banned Books Week? Yeah, September 23rd through uh, the 29th is Banned Books Week. So we're going to talk a little bit about that on the next episode. Join me on Thursday for that. In the meantime, go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.